You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Thank you for being with me. Being with me for your, for your week. Your week's very busy. And uh, I, I thank you for listening to this podcast. You have a lot of choices. And you're, you're choosing to be with me. You're choosing to be with me. And Ryan's here. I'm here. Don't I'm... forget Ryan. If you don't want to be with me, you can be with Ryan. I'm choosing to be with you. Thank you for choosing to be with me, choosing to be with Michael. Yeah, and he's still got the mustache. Some people have commented on the mustache. They like it. Some I forgot people like was, the mustache. I forgot it was still there. I think I like the mustache when it has a scruff with it. Yeah, it's a little less... Um, Jarring. Por- porny. Porny. Yeah. Porny. Porny. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, we'll get to the guest in a, in a, in a second, but uh, I'm just going to let you know that I'm going to be in St. Louis May 13th with Tom Welling. We're going to do a Smallville Nights on a Friday night, so look at that at St. Louis con. Uh, you could uh, we're going to post something uh, here soon. So May 13th, that weekend in St. Louis, I'll be in Liverpool May 21st or that weekend around there. Uh, June 10th, Illinois Metropolis Con in uh, Metropolis, Illinois. June 17th for two weeks, Australia, Perth, and Sydney. Uh, July 28th, Raleigh, and August 12th, Boston. Uh, so make sure you come see me. Please come see me. Uh, also, uh, the Inside of You online store is open. If you want to get any cool merch, <clears throat> Smallville stuff, there's Smallville script signed, lunch boxes, Inside of You tumblers, tons of cool stuff. So go to the Inside of You online store. And also, if you want any Sunspin merch or you want to Zoom me, uh, you could Zoom me on sunspin.com. And there are Zooms there. You could book the band. I'm on Cameo. Eh, you know, it's all that stuff. Um, and what are our handles if you want to follow us? If this is your first time listening, I hope you'll you'll join us. At inside of you pod on Twitter, at inside of you podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Oh, and that is how you can find it. That's it. It's yeah. easy. Also, if you want to join Patreon, join me. Support the podcast. We need you. Go to patreon.com slash inside of you. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Patreon.com slash inside of you. And uh you know, however you want to support the podcast, there's a lot of cool stuff on there. There's tiers. I send merch. Uh, I'll send you a message after you join. We could use your help. So thank you. This week's guest, Mark Paul Gosler. I, I've, I've been wanting to get him on the podcast for a while. He's fantastic. He's such a great guy. Um, you've seen him on everything. Um, mixed uh, The Passage. He's been on tons of shows um, and movies. You, you know him a lot by Saved by the Bell. Um Zach Morris. So I finally got him on the podcast. And he was very uh, open and uh, gave me a lot of good stuff, gave us a lot of good stuff. So um, so without further ado, let's get inside of Mark Paul Gosler. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Wait a minute. We're starting this podcast off with you have a bad memory. <laughs> I really do. How, how have you done all these shows, all these shows that require you learning a lot of dialogue and your memory isn't good? Because I always say the same thing, like, I can't remember shit. I have to go over shit a million times before I get it right. I have a, a flash memory. And I can remember things like if, if you told me, if you give me a piece of paper with a monologue on it, I could probably get it in about five minutes. No problem. But retaining it, it goes out. It, when I walk out the door, it's gone. And I just, it's like a, um, I was listening to Howard Stern yesterday and he was saying like his memory is like a fishbowl. Like he goes to the other side of the fishbowl and it's a new experience. That's how I am. I, kinda, I guess <laughs> I live in the moment, which is scary because a lot of great things have happened to me and I don't remember a lot of it. And I feel bad for the people that experienced it with me. For instance, my wife, right? She'll say, do you remember this? And I'm like, I don't, but it doesn't mean I don't love you. And I, it doesn't mean that I didn't have a great time doing it. It's just my brain doesn't work that way. Wow. So what, give me an example of something you might not remember, maybe going to, uh, you know, the botanical gardens together something that was really nice and sweet and it was like five years ago, you won't really be able to retain that or you, you kind of, it's vague. Very vague. I'd say vague. Um, there's certain, yeah. I mean, 
again, I can't, how, how would I remember these things? Cause I can't, you know, how can I remember those experiences and give you an example if I can't remember them? <laughs> uh, this, very true. this was the whole reason that I started the podcast. Uh, my, my podcast um, was because I don't remember my experience on Saved by the Bell to a certain t- degree. And the degree of that was, I don't remember the work of it. And I don't remember the day to day of it, but I remember little experiences here and there when we'd go offset, when we'd go to Ed Bevix and we'd hang out with other uh, child actors, when we'd go uh, on location to Palm Springs or Hawaii or things like that. You, you remember little bits and pieces like that. Um, but just the other day, I mean, Tiffany, um, who, uh, if people don't know, played Kelly, uh, she was talking to me and she goes, Remember when I got my license and I drove up to you and I got in an accident with you in the car? And I go, You did? Like, I have no recollection wow. of that. And that was a big thing for her. And she says, yeah, you helped me like work through it. And I, I, have no, I have no idea what she's talking about. It's as if I'm talking to a stranger. That is unbelievable how you just don't remember. I mean, I remember <laughs> shit, but like I, I'm not one who could learn a monologue in five minutes. I'll take a week to learn it. And then I'll know it inside out. And I, it kind of stays with me for a little while. But I think I'd rather have your memory in a sense that you could just pick up something, do it, and then I don't know. I guess there's a bad bad side to both. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you remember when your kids were born, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have I have four of them, so I, I you know I have I have four chances to remember. But yes, I remember I remember the burns. Where did you and I meet? You think the first time? This you're never going to get that. I, I I think didn't you play hockey? I, I used to play hockey. Um, you know, it's funny. I was I was trying to remember if this story is true or not because it lives in my head, so I have no one to ask. But when I got NYPD Blue, I had just gotten off of um, a WB show, and Smallville was on CW, right? Mm-hmm. WB, and then it became, and, and then went to CW, right? Right, uh, and and because um, what wasn't it like WB and UPN, and then they all. Ver- merged into like the CW or something like that. Am I getting that right? I, I know that Warner Brothers, WB became CW. I don't know if UPN did. Did they, Ryan? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Fuck, you're asking the wrong person. Well, the, the story was, is that I was on a WB show and it was pilot season. And I actually went in to go read for uh, a Stephen Bochco pilot called Philly with Kim Delaney. And before I walked in, um, they had already offered it to Tom Everett Scott, who I did a movie with a few years um, prior. And I said, fuck it, I'm going, I'm still going in. I, w- I want to go in and I want to get this role. I really like the role and I think I can reverse their offer. Um, which, you know, is, it, it doesn't happen in, in, in this business. Um, but I went in and I, it was the first time I met Stephen. At the end of it, he says, you're really good and I'd like to work with you. And I thought, oh, you know, he's just being nice. And uh, he goes, I know it's pilot season, but keep me up to date. If you get if you get something, let me know. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting thing. So we tried with my management at the time. Uh, we tried to get anything we possibly could. And Smallville came around. And I looked at it and I go, I'm not right for this. This isn't my jam. I, 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 I'm not a, I don't know much about the superhero world. I didn't grow up with it. Um, I didn't quite understand the character. But I remember going in for Smallville and really shitting the bed on that interview. But it was just so that I could possibly get something in pilot season so that I could go back to Stephen Bochco and bring it to him. Uh, and that, that, that I think that, I don't know if you and I met while we were reading or if you were offered that. No, um, I, I, I read, I read for that. Uh, it was one of those things where they said, you know, 700 guys came in. I'm like, what the, what are they fucking doing wrong? Why don't you tell me what they're doing wrong? That was the kind of thing. Did you? So you read for it? I did read for it, and I don't know if you, you are right for the part. Thing. You were. No. I think you were right for no. that. I mean, no, not then, not then, not, not then. I was not then. I was, you know, I was a very immature twenty-eight year old, I think, at the time, and I wasn't right then. Um, it took me a while to to, to blossom, as they say, Michael. But, <laughs> um, but uh, after that, I got uh, I, I actually didn't need to get anything in that pilot season because Stephen Bochco came and offered me a role on NYPD Blue to replace uh, Rick Schroeder. Wow. So it all worked out. How but, hard was it, by the way, working on a series like NYPD Blue? Because it was really popular and there's I mean, it's pretty intense, right? 
Yeah, I'm glad. I, I'm glad we're not doing it now. I'm glad I'm not like walking onto a show that like that now because with all social media and everyone has an opinion and you can read about everyone's opinions. Back then, uh, early 2000, there was one guy with a blog, um, uh, Seppenwall, um, Alan Seppenwall, who you know still writes and critiques stuff, and he had a, a fan page and. I just remember reading that I was going to shit the bed. I was going to bring the franchise down. What? Uh, I was horrible. And by the way, I thought they were right. Like I was, I was literally, um, uh, I was literally uh, thinking the same thing. Like I'm a California kid. I'm playing a New York detective alongside Dennis Franz, who's arguably the best um, actor of that generation. Uh, you know, he, he had been nominated nine times for an Emmy uh, through the course of that uh, 12-year run. And I'm coming in as as this kid who I, I didn't feel I proved myself. I didn't read for the role. So Stephen Bochco basically hired me off of an audition that I did for another role. Um, but, I, you know, I'm sure you've done things where you've been offered things and you doubt yourself. You're like, I, do they... Do they really think I can do this character? Can I do this? Can I, do I think I can do this character? Yeah. And you know what's scarier is when you actually get an offer. You'd almost rather audition because they see you audition and they're like, yes, that's what you're doing yeah. is right. Exactly. Because when you go get an offer and you go on set and you start doing something, they're like, no. Yeah. Like, what do you, t- I don't know what the fuck to do. You just gave me an offer. What am I? Then you feel kind of lost. Yeah. That's and, terrifying. And you, it, it, I'm sure you and I are the same way. Like I have no problem going into an audition and being rejected, right? Not getting it. Oh, I've done that a million times. Whatever. I mean, it happens to all of us, right? We go in, we give our best. We're not the guy. Maybe it's a look. Maybe it's our read. Maybe it's the casting director, the producers having a bad day, whatever it is. But the one thing that I would think hurts the most is being fired off of something, getting something, being on a set, being around your peers, and then going, yeah, you know what? This isn't what we wanted. And then being fired. That'd Have be you the been worst. fired? Have you been fired? <laughs> uh, the only one that I remember being fired for was a commercial. I believe it was for like Whammo or something like that. <laughs> and I got fired off the commercial. My my consolation prize was like a box full of toys. But uh, you'll, you'll like this. Um, I was replaced by Paul Walker, who wow. at the time, like Paul and I would were the two blondes in the uh in the industry at that time you know we were probably eight or nine at the time and we were the the guys that would do all the commercials if you needed a blonde kid it was either paul walker or mark paul wow (laughs) you know i remember i remember getting fired uh it was only the one time i got fired but they they made me the offer it was uh a will ferrell and uh mckay uh show oh uh, nice big top show and they just made me an offer I had a meeting and they made me an offer and I went in and the whole time they're like, you're killing it. We're watching dailies. The director's coming up to me every day. Oh my God, you're killing it. You're killing it. You're killing it. We ended up having a screening at my house of the show with the cast and everybody. And then two weeks later, they called me, the producer in tears and said, well, the good news is, I mean, they want to pick us up for five episodes, but we have to let you go. They want to replace your character. They think your character is too dark and says the wrong shit and and i was like what we just screened this at my house and every day you're telling me how great i am and it just shows you how it all is bullshit you just you never know when it's gonna happen and i, I was just like holy fuck they just let me go i've never been let go and it just it is crushing but then i remember sitting in my office and kind of looking outside going all right you're alive Breathe, breathe. You got a dog here. I love your dog. You love your dog. You got a house. You're lucky to be here. I started to, you know, these affirmations, the reaffirming that, you know, hey, you know, you're okay. You're going to be okay. But it was, it was, it was tough to be let go, especially off like your heroes, Will Ferrell. And like, you know, wow, I'm going to be really working with Will Ferrell. It's his show. And look, the show never made it to air. Uh, they never even shot those five episodes. But still, that feeling I had was like, here was my chance. You know, Adam McKay wrote, wrote me an email. Hey, it was nothing you did. I'd love to work with you in the future. Of course, that never happens. How many times do you hear that? Besides Bochco telling you I want to work with you and it actually happens, it almost never happens. Has that ever happened before with you? No, the only guy that's been that way with for me has been Bochco because I did NYPD Blue and then he went and jumped to Commander-in-Chief um, 
a, f- a year after we wrapped NYPD Blue, and then he did a show called Raising the Bar, and he hired me for that as well. Um, and then years later, he actually gave me my f- uh, second directing gig on one of his shows called Murder in the First. Um, wow. But he always thought of me. He always he was he was he was really good to me. He was like a father figure. He was the first guy I went to when I. Uh, uh, <laughs> when I got a divorce and I needed a place to stay, I, I, I went to, you know, his, his, uh, palace in the, um, in the Palisades and said, Hey, could I, uh, can I rent a room for a little bit? <laughs> he goes, what'd you do? <laughs> Shit happens, man. And he, he was like, he was like a, a great father. He, he, um, it was, he, he always gave it to me straight. I remember sitting in his kitchen. It was late because, you know, these things happen out of nowhere. And, uh, he, he just said, uh, what, what are your plans? I said, I'm, I'm going to try to make this work. And he just said, don't, it's okay. Let it go. He's like, he got a good run out of it. Yeah. Yeah. He gave it to me straight, man. He just said, uh, just, just let it go. And he was right. He was right. He was right. Yeah. Yeah. Inside of you is brought to you by Faraday. I wanted these guys as a sponsor I have spent so much money buying their product because I've never felt shirts that feel this way. Faraday makes delicious clothing. Uh, I don't know what else to tell you, how many people have gone, what material is that? That feels really nice. Get your hands off me. Um, It's a great product. Everyone is talking about fake spring and how difficult it is to dress around this time. But that's because it is. It can be so difficult to find the right outfit in the spring when every day is different and the weather can change at the drop of a hat. And luckily for all of us, Faraday makes it way easier. They make the perfect clothes for all seasons. Ryan, what is Faraday? Faraday is a family-run brand making high-quality, timeless clothing with modern design and functionality. It's that kind of effortless style you want every time you go digging in your closet, that set, that shirt that dress that feels like you've had them for years, right? This is what we want. We want something that feels like we've worn it, and that's what Faraday is. Maybe it's a gorgeous print, and it looks like it might be vintage, but it fits so well that it feels like it was made just yesterday just for you. Guys, that's Faraday. And Faraday is so confident in the quality of their stuff, they have a lifetime guarantee of quality. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever forever no matter what talk about making it easier to get dressed and right now Faraday is giving all inside of you listeners 20 percent off that's 20 percent off and they have a guarantee that they'll replace or fix your clothes forever i don't know how you guys don't buy it. i love this company head to faradaybrand.com that's f-a-h-e-r-t-y brand dot com and use the code inside of you at checkout and snag 20 percent off all your new spring staples that's code inside of you at faraday f-a-h-e-r-t-y brand.com for 20 percent off my good friends at faraday inside of you is brought to you by shopify if you've never used shopify i know how to do it i use shopify from my inside of you podcast They have made it so easy for me to keep track of products, keep track of what products are doing well, inventory. It's all at the click of a button and so simple. Shopify has really changed my life in a lot of ways. Things need to be easy for me to use them. Do you understand, Ryan? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's simple. I like things simplistic. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business so upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. And believe me, this podcast started selling uh, a few products, and we weren't doing that great. And But it... Shopify made it so easy for people to get merch and things like that. Uh, They set up the whole shipping thing. So you just print out the label. Here's their address. It just prints it out. You really don't do a heck of a lot. Uh, Today, business is great. Uh, My Shopify account is kicking ass. And, you know, I love how Shopify has the tools and resources that make it easy for any business to succeed from down the street to around the globe. 
Um, and like mine, Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale, reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting of conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. It's more than a store. Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. And if you go to Shopify right now, Go to shopify.com slash inside, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash inside right now. Shopify.com slash inside. Are you one of those guys that just like you don't want you don't like to fail? So you wanted to like, I gotta make this work. Cause I'm kind of like that. I don't want things, I don't want to fail. I wanna, how do we work this out? How do we figure this out? And you're like that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, don't you think it's our ego then? I mean, Probably. I, 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 yes. I don't like to have I don't like to have those check marks on my on my resume. You know, it's right. uh um I, I, I feel like I I try I, I like being in control of certain things, other things I'm a Pisces. So I kind of go, <laughs> yeah, certain things I like to keep in control. Other things I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it, man. Not, not worth my time. Right. Um, and even with the divorce, like I tried to make it work to a certain point. And then once I realized it was over, over, I moved on very quickly and that was it. I was done. It happens every time I'm on these zooms, I raise my hand. Yeah, and, 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 and says, on here it you says you're waving to me. I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? Why is there a, a hand waving at me? <laughs> if I could figure that out, I'm literally, uh, you know, because we, <laughs> we do these Zooms for auditions now, and so you have to meet people on Zooms or whatever, and I'll raise my hand. I'm, I'm, I'm a hand talker. <laughs> so I raise my hand, and then on Zoom it says that I'm raising my hand. I'm like, uh, try not to. But. Jesus. Uh, do you get pretty personal on your podcast? What's your podcast called? It's called Zach to the Future. We're taking a hiatus right now, um, maybe uh, indefinitely. Um, we did about 50 episodes. We're 50 away from completing the run of the show. Uh, but basically, it was every episode, we'd start from the very beginning. And uh, it was me and my co-host, Dashiell Driscoll, who wrote uh, Zach Morris's Trash. Uh, it's a great YouTube series where he basically will you know spell it out why my character zach morris was trash uh and he, he started as a as a, like as sort of a, a funny little um you know sketch thing for funny or die and then it took off and he, he did a, i think he did about four seasons of that and i thought if i'm gonna do a podcast i want to do it with this guy um he's also a writer on the uh, reboot of say by the bell Wow. And um, yeah, so we, we started this podcast because I don't remember my experience. It was just sort of like a re-education of, of the show. And I'd watch the show a few times, take notes, see if I could jog any sort of memory of the experience. And we were just talking about it. It'd be an hour of just sort of or, you know, just, just bullshitting. How do you feel when you watch yourself? I mean, are you an actor? Because some, <laughs> some actors hate watching themselves. They loathe it. Hey. Criti- you hate it? Hey. Even when you were young, even when you were young, torture. torture. No, I could appreciate certain things. I could appreciate certain things, but then I would bum myself out because I then work with the new generation of Saved by the Bell, the new cast, and I realize, and I go, God, they were they're so much more fucking talented than I ever was back then. Like, wh- why did I? Wh- why did my career go the way it did? From that, like, that to me was mediocre compared to what these new what this new generation is doing um so i look at it at that point like i i, I say i could have done that better i could have taken it more serious um I, I i try to learn from things but i don't i learn from experiences on set i don't learn from watching myself because then it just becomes like a it's already set man it's like yeah. it, you know i i can't do anything about it right it's like i'm just gonna go to sleep grumpy is there and, something though that you watched that you go, you know what? I was fucking good in that. You know what? I appreciate yeah. my work in that. There is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What is that? Uh, do, you, do you recall? I, I really like pitch when I was on pitch. I really liked that show. Um, I like the passage. I, I like some of my work that I've done recently, even on mixed dish. There was some funny things that I thought um, I kind of got right. Uh, and there's a lot. I still, you know, feel like I, I got wrong, but um I think it's easier to watch myself if I'm playing a character. If, you know, I'm sure it's the same for you. If you're outside of Michael, 
yeah. and you're playing a complete character, I can't judge it as much because, right. you know, it's, it, and I, and I, I guess I look back at like Saved by the Bell and that was a character. That wasn't me. I wasn't a cool kid. I didn't even have blonde hair. I mean, I was, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, my mother's Indonesian. My father's Dutch. Um, I, I, you know, I have, uh, I come from a, a mixed family. And I'm playing the whitest kid in America, <laughs> you know? That's true. And it's, and, but you would think like, oh, I look back and say, oh, that's a character. But I, I just, some of the choices that I made um, with the dialogue, I, I, I just feel I could have done better. But did you have a lot of experience before then with acting? <laughs> Not really. I mean, commercials and stuff. Yeah. So, well, I mean, it's, it, you can't be that hard on yourself when you really hadn't done anything except for commercials Dude, growing at- up. But look at these kids nowadays. Look at these kids. I mean, I, just watch any show that has a kid on it, and they're amazing. Like they they have such talent. Not only that, they're 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 acting, they're singing, they're dancing. They're ju- they're just entertainers. But don't you think some of it has to do with the how it's written, the quality of the work? I mean, you guys are on Saved by the Bell. No offense, but it was like kind of fluff, fun. You know, <laughs> right? You- don't say that, Michael. You know, I got in trouble one time for saying that. Well, I remember uh, it's a difference. No, between- I agree with you. I agree with you. Right. I totally agree with you. But 12 years ago, I had said that the work I did on Saved by the Bell was not breaking bad. You know, basically saying that the writing was not breaking bad. Well, am I right? I mean, anybody yes, would say, tell I, um, you you're right. Oh, I got to. I, I remember being on a bicycle ride after I said that. I said it in some, you know, press line or something. I was on a bicycle ride and some buddy from TMZ uh, got my number and called me and I, I didn't even know, I, you know, back then I, I just picked up the phone, hello? Uh, would you like to, um, you know, comment on on your comment about <laughs> Saved by the Bell? Because, you know, it sounds like you're ungrate- un- ungrateful for your experience on the show. I was like, oh, fuck, no. It's not, what I, me- it's not what I meant. Of course it's not what you meant. It's just obvious. It's like, this is a, a kid show. This was the, what was it, the 80s, yeah. the 90s? It was yeah. just kind of, it was on early. It wasn't written for like a darker, you, we get it. But like, I think that if somebody gave you a different material at that age and you were really working on it, things could have been different in that in that show. Maybe, maybe. I mean, you know, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that, 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 uh, that show is precious to some people. It still it's is. precious to it's a amazing. lot of people. I mean, it's look at the duration. I mean, how long it's lasted with the the reunions and the, you know, it's uh, it's exciting. I mean, it's something that you've been doing since. Well, I mean, the last for since when? What year did you start? Uh, eighty nine. Nine. And the last reunion of it was well recently, right? Yeah, we just finished up last season in July. Uh, well, the second season of the Peacock reboot. Uh, we, we just finished in September of last year. And how much fun is that? Do you like it? I really do. Um, like I said, the, the cast is amazing. It's, it's fun to work with the OG cast as well. Uh, <laughs> one of the best experiences that I've had, um, was directing last season, one of the episodes. So getting to direct the new cast, the old cast, it was, it was a lot of fun. That's a amazing. Lot of fun. Did you know, growing up in California, do you think things were, it was harder for you to grow up in California than it would be if you were growing up in the Midwest or somewhere away from the whole industry. Do you think, you know, things would have been a lot different for you? No, not really. Because I always, I always think that I grew up outside of the industry. I grew up in the Valley. I grew up in um, Sun Valley. And uh, for me, my, I always say this, but my, my world was, was very Brown uh, sepia toned in a way. Um, We lived in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood uh, the other white people were sometimes, uh, like hell's angels or bikers. It's a little rough crowd in, in Sun, Sunland, Sun Valley, Tonga. Right. Uh, it was a rough crowd back then. And I used to, I used to go to a private school, uh, sort of halfway between Sun Valley and let's say Studio City. And it was a private school there. And you would travel down Laurel Canyon heading, uh, sort of Southwest, South. And you would see Mulholland and you would see the green hills. And I always like, you know, and, and then when I'd go for auditions, we'd go over Mulholland, we'd go down into Hollywood. And for me, that was like green. It was success. Uh, it was different than where I grew up where, you know, everyone had manicured lawns and my lawn 
manicured, but you know, next door neighbors might be dirt. Um, and I grew up around a lot of dirt. And so I didn't feel like I grew up, uh, in the industry in Hollywood in Beverly Hills. You didn't feel you know, that at all. No. And, and, uh, you know, my, my really good friend, Brecken Meyer, he, he kind of grew up in the Hills and went to Beverly Hills high and, uh, sort of was, you know, hanging out with people. But when I, when I went back home, I, I, I hung out with just civilians in a way, you know, I didn't, I didn't hang out with people in the industry. My parents weren't in the industry. Um, it was a fluke for me to get in. I just kind of got in on a whim. How, what, what was that? I'm sure you've talked about that, but what is it? No, it was, I was four years old and I, my mom had a friend who did like print work. She was a model that did print work. And, and, um, she said, oh, you know, the, the, the typical thing, you got your kid's cute. You should get him in front of the camera. <laughs> And uh, that's exactly what we did. We just sort of used her agent to get into um, the business. And I did print work for a while and then did commercials and then theatrical stuff. But I grew up in the Valley. I, I, um, I, I, I uh, did not feel a part of the business in any way. Right. Outsider. Now, you're uh, I look, I had a dysfunctional family. I always talk about this shit on the podcast. I had dysfunction, but my parents stayed together. They should have got divorced a long fucking time ago. I always said that I like, I wish you would have got, no, we wanted you to get through high school. My like, fuck you. You were so fucked up. It was way worse for us. You should have got divorced. Your parents got divorced at a young age, right? Well, I don't know that they legally got divorced. They were separated. And it was really odd because my dad would sometimes be there and then sometimes he wouldn't. Uh, and so I never knew, you know, what, what you were going to get. And then I know that he had an apartment somewhere and, I stayed there a few times, but it, they were never officially divorced. Uh, neither one of them really wanted to, to, to give it up, even though it was over. I mean, it, it was over as long as I can remember. Um, but yeah, they, they, they never moved on. Although my dad, my dad was with the same woman that uh, kind of that he was with uh, at the time that they, they split until the day he died um, with the same woman. She was an angel to him. Uh, her name was Angela. And, um, you know, she, she just became a part of our family and, and, um, sweet lady. And she took care of my father when he was sick. Uh, and, and, but yeah, they, but they never, I don't think they ever got a divorce. What year did he pass? Uh, last year, oh, yeah. uh, not last, 2020. Was that just brutal for you? Was it something that you were expecting or was it just kind of happened? Yeah, it was something we, we were expecting. It was, we were expecting it. He, he, um, he was in poor health and, and we sort of, I, I knew it. I was working at the time and um, I got a chance uh, to, to see him two weeks before he passed away. It was one of those things that we knew he was going to, he was going to pass. So right. he passed pretty quickly after that. And your parents, they were always supportive with, with you acting and doing all these things. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, again, they were never in the industry. They had no, um, desire to be a part of the industry. My father worked in sort of uh, a manufacturing plant for aluminum in Torrance. And he would make that drive from Sun Valley to Torrance every day, which was uh, crazy. It's probably why he wanted to get a divorce <laughs> so he could live closer. Right. Um, but uh, my mom was, you know, I'm, I'm putting air quotes up right now, was my was my manager until I was 18. Wow. Um, they were supportive in the way that you're supportive of your kid doing little league. You know, they, they, they took me to every game. They, they rooted for me from the sidelines. Told you they um, loved you. Told you they support you. Told you they loved you. All that stuff. All that stuff. I, 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 I had nothing but love for my parents. We, I heard that word. I love you every day. Wow. Um, but I think they also love the, 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 the monetary aspect of, of being a, a child actor. You know, we have to put some of it into a trust, but then others, you know, like, wow, we got a car and it has <laughs> the license plate says for MPG. Oh, well, thank <laughs> Wait you. Wait a minute, I Mark. can't drive it. I can't drive it, but thank you. That's my car. Yeah. But they socked a lot of money away from you. And I got to think that, you know, being on a show, you probably didn't get paid that much when you're on Saved by the Bell. No, I think at the height of it, again, I don't know the finances because I wasn't involved at that time, but I think at the height of it. We were getting paid maybe five thousand a week for a show. Five thousand a week on a show. Now you think that's a lot of money. Five thousand dollars a week. Well, you got agents and taxes, and you're walking out of there with two grand a week on a show that's a hit show that people are kids are watching all across the world. 
and you're making five thousand dollars an episode. I think when people assume that when you're on TV, they assume you're making millions of dollars, but that's not where you're making your bucks. No, it's not where you're making their bucks. And then you think like, well, you went to syndication. <laughs> syndication for us. I get syndication checks. I, I mean, I, I, I giggle about it because <laughs> somebody had to print that on a check. But it's like 13 cents, 10 cents for, you know, uh, hundreds of shows being shown. It, it, it's run its course. <laughs> Jesus. So, no, I don't I don't make it. And then you would think like, oh, well, what about merchandise? Well, we got screwed out of that, too. We don't get any money for merchandise. Um, you know, we don't we don't get much. So. Uh, when you see our names as producers on a, on the the Peacock show, it's a nice it's a nice way for us to be a part of the show again. Right. And we we have always from day one. Um, well, I shouldn't say from day one. I, I'd say there was a period there where we were all struggling to break free of that you know the, the, the sort of stigma attached to Saved by the Bell. But for the most part, we've we've all been very positive about our experiences with the with that uh, show. It's also amazing that you've, um, are you guys all still friends mostly? Sure. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I read, and, you know, of course this is old news, but it said you, you actually dated three of your co-stars, but you're probably a kid when that happened. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it all happened in the span of the, the show. None of us dated after the show was canceled. <laughs> And so yeah. there was no bad blood about that. There was like, who was the one that you think you crushed on the hardest? That like it wasn't just dating. Like you, you thought you were in love with. Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So I, I think I can say that I, I probably didn't have the biggest crush on Tiffany only because Tiffany and I had a different relationship. Her and I were very. Uh, we we're almost like siblings in a way. I know that's hard for people wa who watch the show. It's like Zach and Kelly were siblings, but that's, we really had a, a closeness that that's what that closeness translated into. And it's still to this day, she's probably the closest one that I, that, uh, to, that I'm, that I have a relationship with now. Wow. Um, yeah. Her and I, you know, probably see each other more than anyone else. And, and uh, partly because I, I really like her husband, Brady, uh, <laughs> he's just an, he's just an amazing dude. And, yeah, and they have good kids, and and I you know I, I really like her, and I, I I I yeah I like her family and stuff like that. I like everyone's, but Tiffany and I always had this closeness, but it was it translated into being siblings, and then when we kind of dated, it was just awkward. It was weird. It, it, it didn't feel as great as like the relationship we had before. Inside of you is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy. I can't tell you how many emails or texts or messages I get from people telling me that BetterHelp is helping them. And I really love that. I love uh, talking about something that works, that helps people, that is a sponsor on the podcast where we talk about mental health. It's very important. Ryan's still with BetterHelp. I'm still with BetterHelp, and it's still... Helping. helping. It's it still, still helping. Helping. I like hearing that. You know, people don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, uh, teeth grinding, even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating, overeating. Stress shows up in all kinds of ways. And in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, to do less and maybe try some therapy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Ryan, you like to see people. I do. I think it helps. I do too. I like yeah. to see the person I'm talking to, but that's just me. If you don't feel like seeing a face, you don't have to. Don't you could also to. text. You could, have, you could do whatever you want. Yep. It's so much more affordable than in-person therapy. Trust me on that one. Uh, going to in... Uh, in-person therapy is, is is so expensive. It's I, I'd say some cases it's triple, quadruple the cost of better health mm. by far. Uh, you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. I believe it really can, truly. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and inside of you listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash inside. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Give therapy a shot. Better help online therapy. Inside of You is brought to you by Geico. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? 
Of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, add the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. Uh, you know, I know this because I think we've compared bruises or like, you know, I know that you do the cycling and the motocross and the auto racing and all this shit. You, your passion is for racing cars. Aren't you, are you, you're pretty bruised up, aren't you? Yeah. I love that quote. His passion is racing cars. I think I said that back in 1996 when I was racing cars. Not anymore. Quickly you don't race any cars anymore. Well, no, I, I, I quickly realized that racing cars takes a lot of money. <laughs> Uh, and, and yeah. I, I don't, I, I have four kids I, I go to private school, so I, I can't, uh, spend my money on, on airplanes and cars like I used to. Um, my background is racing motocross. I started racing when I was five. I, I started riding when I was three. My brother is 16 years older than me. He's still in the industry. He is considered one of the greatest mechanics of motocross history. Wow. And, uh, he's the one that kind of got me into it. He has four boys. They were all pro at one point in their career. Um, and then that sort of translated into racing cars because that was a new thing. And then, uh, then when that dried up, I went into racing bicycles, um, and, and, uh, did road biking and, and did pretty well. I, I, I raced at the highest level of amateurs, um, and traveled with a team and just had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, Pretty banged up. I mean, you and I both have had surgery on our neck. Yeah. Um, Do you have an artificial yeah, desk I, I, in your neck? Do you have an artificial desk? No, not yet. You, are you fused? No, no, no. I, I had the first thing where they just scope you. I know oh. you. You have you have the fusion. Yeah, I've had right? the fusion in the neck, and then seven surgeries on my lower back. So yeah. Oh my god! Well, and why? How did you? Just hockey how? and degenerative discs, and you know, I hate it's embarrassing, but I think it all started at me working in a grocery store. And uh, we were throwing boxes, stocking boxes in the back. And everybody was throwing these like boxes of Del Monte fucking fruit or whatever the hell they were. And I remember catching one and going, oh, man, that was weird. And ever since that, they all started. All the problems started. So really, when I was about 17, I was 17. So I had my first surgery when I was 18. And it just never stopped. They say once you have one surgery, you you start having a lot. And that's what sort of happened to me. But you haven't had any surgeries, really? No, I mean, I, my first major injury happened when I was 16. I, I fractured my sternum. I, I tore ligaments in my neck. My neck was, was really bad. And I, I never got it fixed to the point I should have. And, and really um, uh, sort of just been aware more of, of my neck. I mean, if there's one thing I could tell the, the younger me was, just take some time off, you know, and, and get, get it right because it will catch up to you at some point. And it caught up for me after I, I, I did pitch, um, you know, we were training every single day, just at, at, a, at a level 10 and above. Um, and then after that season, I got my first shoulder surgery. And then the next, uh, two years after that, I got another shoulder surgery. And then the year after that, I got a neck surgery. And those are the only surgeries I've ever had. Um, a lot of stitches, a lot of broken things, but never, never any surgeries. Do you want to race cars again at some point? I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to, but I also know that how expensive it is. So well, how, how is it, how it, expensive like, is it? It's pretty, I mean, listen, I, I need to be on, on Grey's Anatomy, like Patrick Dempsey, and then just basically, <laughs> uh, use that money to just supplement my, uh, racing career. He, he's a great driver, right. um, but he also made some great money and, and the more money you have, the more seat time you can get, the better of a driver you can be and the faster you'll go. So, um, and the more opportunities. So racing cars is a, is a, is a pretty rich man and woman sport in my opinion. How fast have you gone? What's the fastest speed you've ever gone in a car? Yeah, I don't know because a lot of the cars that I race, they don't have speedometers, but I do remember being on a motorcycle and I used to do road racing on motorcycles and I was at Fontana and I was on a, um, a street bike. It was, I think I got a loaner from Yamaha at the time or, or Honda. 
and the speedometer was on there. And I remember going down the front straightaway and looking at the, the speedometer and going, that says 160. Holy shit. And then, you know, going into the first turn. But that was the only time that I've ever had like a speedometer on on the thing I was racing. And I we were doing 160 on the front straight. Jesus. Motorcycles scare the shit out of me. I just won't get on one. I just, I just, I just like, you know, you, be. you know what? I shouldn't be. No, you should. Be. Yeah. It's I, not I, about you driving. It's about the guys that are backing up or trying to get in the lane. They don't see you. And that's, that's the danger, right? I discourage a lot of my friends from getting motorcycles all the time. And I'm an advocate for motorcycles. I'm an advocate for motorcycle safety. Um, but I always discourage people like it, it, it's too dangerous, especially here in Los Angeles. I mean, I, I see it all the time. You have so many, and they say, well, you know, I used to commute on a motorcycle when I was doing NYPD blue for those four years. I commuted when I was in Atlanta. Um, every day, all I had was a motorcycle there when I was there for six months doing the passage. Um, I feel safer on freeways, oddly enough, because you only have to really worry about two directions, what's coming at you and possibly what's coming behind you. But you're you're going so fast, hopefully, that you're, you'll stay out of trouble, which is kind of weird to say. Right. Um, but on a street, man, it's four directions that you have to worry about what's coming at you from the sides, from behind you. Just a lot. And then if you go like, and I never do this, but a lot of guys like to go to the Mahal end and do the roads. And man, that's just too fucking dangerous for me. It's like if there's a pebble or, or a debris in the corner. Anything. And I'm going through there, or a cyclist or a car jumps the yellow line. Fuck, man. You're done. You're done. That easily. That quickly, too. You know, you, you said once you always had a feeling that you're losing everything, so you're a real saver. Is that still true? That you always feel like, fuck, I'm not going to have enough money. I'm not going to. What is that? Where does that come from? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 we grew up squarely middle class, but I guess I always felt like we were kind of below middle class because the, the kids that I went to school with, I felt that they, 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 they had a better lifestyle and, you know, than I did. And again, like I said, I always looked up towards the Mahal and the greenness and, and that part of the Valley compared to where we were. Um, I don't know, my, my parents, you know, they, they worked their asses off. They had great work ethic. Um, I, I've, I've, I thought my, I had a career, going until the, you know, the end of Saved by the Bell. And I thought, oh, man, just, you know, I'm, I'm in, this is, this is my, uh, this is my job. I'm, I, I have, I'm going to make a living. And then I didn't work for about two years and it was, it was scary and, and didn't have an income. And it's not like, you know, I, I could go and get a job waiting tables because a, I was re still recognizable B my ego. Um, so, you know, I was like, detailing cars with my cousin uh to try to make a try to make a living at certain things and, and it's not and not that i'm afraid of work because i love working i love to work with my hands i love to i love manual labor um and i i i i, I really do um but the but, ego you know, it was the ego really wasn't it It was the ego it was the ego i was, I was like oh, fucking dude I'm, i can't even walk into a mall without people recognizing me but i, I i'm i'm fighting to get a job like what am i gonna do what like, is shit just yeah it was a bad position to be in. And how long did it take you before you started making money again and you were all right? Uh, well, the show wrapped in 94 when we did the college years. And I think 96 is when I started working again. I got a, I got a TV movie for NBC of all places because we were always on NBC. And I got an NBC movie that I auditioned for. Um, it wasn't an offer. And then uh, after that, things started happening again. But I don't know, man. You know, it's like I, I think that everything is everything is dispensable in a way, you know, nothing is in my eyes forever. And I just want to make sure that I appreciate everything that I have in my life and um, not take it for granted. You know, my, my marriage, my kids, my health. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a point in your life where you just realize, Holy shit, it's all limited, right? Like it's, 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 it's not, it's, it, it's not, we're not going to be here forever. Yeah, that's for sure. I think that's true. The older you get, you start to think about, wow, we're all expendable. We're all going to the same place. How many years do I actually have left? And what do I really love? What do I really want to, who do I really want to spend my time with in these, however, however many years you have, you start to think more about those things. Yeah. I, when I, when I was going through, um, the divorce, my, my, uh, 
therapist at the time, um, he basically said, uh, you know, a lot of people think life is short. He goes, but it's not, it's, it's long. Life is long. And I was 36 when I, when I was going through this and he said, you've only been living your life for about 18 years. You know, when you, when you, be, when you turned 18, you became an adult, you started living your life. He goes, you have another 50 plus years ahead of you that are all yours. You can make, you can, it's your decisions. Uh, and he says, so think about that, like the amount of time it took me to get to 36 and that felt like a lifetime. And he goes, but you, you haven't even, you, you have 50 years of that left. Yeah. Wow. What do you think you would have done if you didn't act? Uh, I don't know. I, I've always been in sport. I, 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 I think like every other kid, I wanted to be in the Super Bowl, and you know, I, I have memories of watching uh, the 49ers in the Super Bowl, Joe Montana. And watching Montana, Rice, Clark, you know, that, uh, and Clark and that catch, and just yeah. you know, having a football in the living room and just diving on the floor and and having <laughs> dreams of doing that uh, one day. And yeah, probably I, I would want to do something in sport. Always yeah. wanted to. Do you still get sensitive? Are you sensitive to, you know, like being on a show and then it gets canceled? Because Lord knows we've all been on shows and they get canceled. Are you one of those that you're just like when somebody goes, oh, they're gonna get, you're going to get picked up, right? Are you usually like not even going there? I know it's not. As, as far as I'm concerned, this is probably it. What's your mentality with all that? Yeah, um, it's funny that you bring this up because my wife, um, you know, she just goes, can't you ever be happy when <laughs> – you know, it's like if 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 I if I get a show, for instance, right, and it's like it, it your show gets picked up. I'm like, yeah, but babe, it has to air, and then after it airs, it has to get um, you know a certain rating. And after the first year, we got to get a second year, and after that, we have to get a syndication. There's always something. Always. And she goes, yeah, but just be happy for what it is. I go, but. I don't know if I can't anymore because we've been in this business for, oh, I, I mean, you, I, I've been in for over 30 years. When did you get your SAG card? Uh, probably when I was uh, early, 23, 24. So 25 years. Yeah. I got my like SAG that. card in 84. <laughs> wow. Uh, and a lot has happened. I mean, I've had a lot of ups and downs, um, but you just, you know, like, I, I you, you, you take a show and, and like pitch, for instance, I auditioned for that. I fought for it. Um, I, I worked my ass off to be that character. Some of the greatest material I'd ever, I ever got, um, you know, some of the best uh, compliments I ever had in my life from people, my peers and critics and things like that. And it doesn't go. And it's Dan Fogelman. Dan Fogelman did This Is Us and Pitch. Those are these two shows that year. This Is Us takes off and becomes what it is. And pitch, you know, shits the bed and, and dies. Then you go to the passage. Again, we get, you know, a great material and, and great IP and great people and uh, lasts a year. Then you go to Mixed Dish and you're on Mixed Dish and you're like, oh my God, well, I can retire off of this. I'm working with Kenya Barris and all the people from Blackish and look at the run Blackish has had, you know, and the, 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 the pedigree that you're working with. And you're like, okay, I'm done. And then it goes a, a season and a half and it's done. See, nothing, nothing is a guarantee. Nothing is a guarantee. So at this point, do you think you have pretty fucking thick skin where you're like, <laughs> you know, like, no. you know, hey, bring it to me. I don't have any expectations. Do no. you think now, like no, your wife I, said, you're going to enjoy the moment more or you still can't do that? No, I don't think I can. I, I, I still care too much. I really do. I really care about. I really care about the work and I care about the people and um, it's a tough business for, for people who really give a shit. I always think that the less, the less shit I gave, the easier this business would be for me. Right. I mean, if you just were like, I don't fucking care. I, I, I just will worry about myself. I just worry about myself and you know, whatever comes, comes. I've never been that way in my life. I've always thought of my family first and then my, my, you know, the, the people around me and, um, yeah, I think I should give less fucks. That, that's going to be my my uh, my resolution for 2022. Give less fucks? Give less fucks. God, it would be so nice. I, I think about it all the time. I just want to care less. Just if I could just care less, I'll be better off. And you try, but you, it's just like, I think that's where passion comes in. It's like you're so passionate that it's hard to give no fucks. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? You're just so passionate about something. You want something to work and when it doesn't, how do you just go, oh yeah, fuck it. I don't give a shit. You give a shit because you care because you're passionate. You know what I mean? Yeah, but then you, I mean, you see it in our business. There's a lot of people that don't give fucks and man, are they successful. Yeah, I know. Fuck them. <laughs> fuck them. Right, fuck them. <laughs> hey, this is called Shit Talking with Mark Paul Gosselaar. Now, is Gosselaar? You know, that Joe Buck. Um, Joe Buck. Said, I always fuck it up. Joe Buck, he fucked it up. He, well, he didn't fuck up, but he did say Gosselaar. And uh, this is when I was on Fox and he had to say my name during the- Gosselaar. You know, Gosselaar. And uh, he got shit for saying that. Like, he gets shit for saying oh, anything. So it doesn't, shit, it doesn't yeah. really matter. So he says Gosselaar. And then people start going, dude, you're such a douchebag. It's Gosselaar. And he's like, oh my God, I fucked up Mark Paul's name. So he calls to apologize to me. What? And yeah, yeah, yeah. He, call, he calls to apologize to me. And I play the game. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? How did you not know my name is Mark Paul Gossler and not Gossel? Like, like, why would you do that? And he felt he was mortified. <laughs> and um, then, you know, we, we, I, I, I kind of let him off the hook and told him I was a prank and whatever. And, and um, we became friends. But it, 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 the, the cor- correct pronunciation is probably Gosselar. Because that's the closest to how we say it in Dutch, which is Hosselaar. Hosselaar. But Hosselaar. You get the Hosselaar. There you go. All right. You might be uh, you might be Dutch. All right. Um, but we just I just say Mark Paul Gosler. 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 Spelled yeah. G O S S L E R. It's the American version. I love that America. Joe Buck called you up to apologize for mispronouncing your name. That is a sweet fucking thing to do. Uh, he's a sweet man. Uh, and and I don't care what anybody says. I like the dude, and I think he does a really good job. Yeah, I do too. All right, this is called Shit Talking with Mark Paul Gosler. This is a, these are my patrons. They give back to the podcast. They care about it. They love it. They get to ask some questions. So this is, you know, you can answer them however you want. Uh, some of them might be redundant because we might have talked about it, but here we go. Lisa H. Obviously, I grew up watching you as Zach Morris, but my question is about a more recent role. I love the show Mixed-ish. So disappointed when it was canceled. Do you feel there were more stories to be told? And what episode was your favorite? I feel there were more stories to be told. I was always looking forward to the day. I think the show started in 88. That's that's when uh, that's when the era that we were in. Um, and I was hoping that we'd get to the 90s because then they could watch Saved by the Bell. Uh, <laughs> yes. And I, I thought that was kind of that would have been kind of fun. Actually, that show is 86. Yeah, fuck, I can't remember, man. See, this is this is my problem. This is what happens. Um, it's what happens. But yeah, it was my favorite episode. Oh man, I I don't remember. I mean, I I, I can't remember what episode was fun. I had I had a lot of fun on that show with with those actors. Um, good good group. Tika Sumter, great actress. Uh, and yeah, I just the, the whole experience was good. Good fun. Dave P., what convinced you to return to Saved by the Bell? Uh, what convinced me to return? Say um, it. Say it. Say money. Just be fucking money. No money. Money was good. I mean, <laughs> money. Money was good. Uh, I'm working with Tracy Wakefield, and um, and see, I had a meeting with her before she started writing, and she pitched me the idea, and I thought it was brilliant. And then when I saw it on the page, I was like, holy shit. She she did it. She cracked it, and then uh, yeah, money and 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 the fact that I get to put my name on as a producer. Those are all good things. Leanne, why do you think Saved by the Bell still resonates with such a younger audience? It's interesting. I, I just had a friend of me send me a video of his daughters, and I believe they're under ten. Um, and uh, I sent the video back because uh, their favorite favorite character is Zach Morris, and they're they're watching. So I have no idea. Um, why the show still resonates? My my kids are watching other things like the Thundermans or something like that on on Nickelodeon. I don't know. Is that, is that a thing? I remember Thunder, the Thundercats. I remember the Thundercats. But this is like a live <laughs> action thing. This is like a, but it's it's like a, this, this TV show where the the family it's kind of kind of like the Incredibles. They all have superhero uh, super abilities, superpowers. Oh wow. Um, and, uh, I don't know if it's on Nickelodeon or, or what my kids watch that. Um, and, and so I'm always, I'm always surprised because there's some really fun shows out there, but people then find Saved by the Bell and it still feels 
current and relevant to them. I don't, Maybe I don't know. it's the simplicity. It's the time. It's the just you you, you care about these guys. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot to it. I mean, you, I mean, you tell me, but I think you know it was just easy to watch. You just threw it on and you just had a laugh, or you just you know, oh, you like the girl, or oh, I want to be the cool guy, or I want to go, you know, I'm the geek. <laughs> you know, it's I don't sort know, of, man. I don't know. I, I, I don't know because there's Saved by the Bell, the new class. There's uh, yeah. Hanging uh, Hang Time. There's California Dreams. All these shows, and for some reason, people pick out Saved by the Bell. Yeah. David H., you've been in some amazing shows, worked with some amazing people. Who do you think has been your biggest mentor, and who have you remained friends with through the years? My uh, biggest mentor was Dennis Franz um, and and that whole crew, uh, Stephen Bochco, Dennis Franz, Mark Tinker. Um, Dennis Franz actually you, got, you became close with and you actually hung out with a lot? Yeah, yeah. He, he retired from the business. Once, once uh, NYPD Blue was over, that was it. He was done. He came to see me do a play in 2010 or 2009. He came to see me do a play uh, in New York. Um, and I asked him at that point, we went out for dinner afterwards and I said, do you, you don't miss it? And he goes, no, not really. Cause he was so fucking good. He's, he, he's, he would, he's just an amazing actor and he kind of just gave it up. Uh, uh, yeah. And just walked away. I mean, he said he made it. I don't, I, I, he made a shit ton of money. I guess this felt, I don't know what he felt. I mean, it gets, don't you think it gets old? Do you ever think about, God, I'd like to have enough money or I'd like to just walk away? Or do you really just like it so much that you want to keep doing it to your old and gray? Or do you kind of feel like, God, I'd like to be done with this shit? There's part of me that would like to be done with the grind, right? I I would love to have Dennis Franz money (laughs) and basically live, you know, the life that I want to live. But there's part of me that there's the creative side of me, right? Where I would still want to be a part of some creative process, whether that's working with uh, directors or producers or what. I don't know if I necessarily need to be in front of the camera. I don't, I, I, I get just as much joy being behind the camera that I do in front. So, but I do like to create. I do like to, I like the process. I like, I like collaborating. Camaraderie. Yeah. Uh, Michelle K, do you keep any cool shit from Saved by the Bell? <laughs> I wish I did. I talk about this on the uh, podcast. Um, I, I I wasn't sentimental at all. You know, being a 16 year old, uh, not, I wasn't sentimental with anything. Uh, my health, you know, girlfriends, whatever. Um, I didn't start becoming sentimental until uh, NYPD Blue. And when that wrapped, I was close to 31. And when that wrapped, um, I took my fake gun. I took my badge. I took my wow. notepad. I took a lamp that was sitting on Sipowitz's desk. I, t- I took whatever the fuck was and bolted down. Um, That's amazing. But from Saved by the Bell, I have nothing. And as I watched the shows, I go, fuck, I wish I would have taken that. Like there was this episode where we had these screech masks. I was like, fuck, I wish I had that. Oh, man. Yeah. I or saved these, a lot of like, shit. Zach shirts. I yeah. stole a lot of you shit. Do? Oh, yeah. I stole a lot of shit from the set. Jackets, like Lex, white president suits. Uh, jacket where i played zod this jacket they made for me um uh a mask that i wore where my character splits in half which is up there onyx uh scripts got shit signed i just was like i always felt like this is gonna be my last show every show i ever did i always thought they're gonna figure me out you know i think a lot of actors think that but i thought just you know i'm gonna get autographs and if i go broke i'll just sell this shit (laughs) <laughs> do you have a problem? Do you have a problem asking people for autographs? No. If you if you were here right now, if you came over, you'd see I have a room full of uh, posters, autograph horror movies. I got the whole cast signed Aliens, my thing by Kurt Russell signed the thing poster in Escape from New York, uh, my Fright Night poster from the director Tom Holland, uh, Evil Dead Bruce Campbell, Kiefer Sutherland, and Jason Patrick signed my Lost Boys poster. Uh, I just I don't give a shit, man. I just I love it. I I was a collector. I went to cons conventions before I was uh, an actor or made it or anything. And I just still feel like that kid. So yeah, I I don't give a fuck, but I know most people do. Most people are like, I don't ask for autographs. That's weird, dude. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I I don't have, I mean, I'm trying to think if I have autographs, I, I, not that I, I I think I have a few jerseys downstairs. Joe Montana. You have Joe Montana? No, uh, I have a football from him. I did ask him for – see, this is the thing. People will fuck it up for you, right? I, I was at a um, – I think it was a Madden event, you know, when, when, when they used to, like, ask celebrities to come out. We were doing, like, a 
a flag football game for Madden. Yeah. And it was down and, and, um, I got, uh, I got Montana's autograph and I asked for another guy's, um, uh, not going to name his name, but he gave me the dirtiest fucking look when I got it. And I was like, man, I, I didn't want to do this to begin with. And now you're giving me, making me feel bad. Wow. Fuck, I'm excited. I mean, I can't do it. Uh, so I, I don't think I've, I don't think I've done it since. I mean, uh, oh, I man. Have, I did that with uh, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was on the show called Breaking, and he was just a guest star. And I had some scenes with him. And I go, and I, I said, fuck, at, for the cast, I bought a whole bunch of boxing, boxing gloves, like six of them or seven of them. And I go, I came in this trailer. I go, hey, would you sign? I go, beforehand, I go, would you mind signing a glove? He goes, no, absolutely, man. Yeah, I'll sign your glove. I'll sign a boxing glove for you. And I went into his uh, trailer, and I had, he goes, what the, what the fuck is this, man? I go, oh, it's just for the cast. He goes, oh, shit, man. I just thought I, thought I was signing for just you, man. I go, oh, oh, you can. My bad. I just thought he goes, no, it's fine, man. It's fine. But I could tell he was upset. And I was like, fuck, dude. And then I thought, who gives a fuck? I'm yeah. never, I'll never see him again. Fuck no, it. I just no. got six autographs. No, no. You know why? Because you were taking advantage. About it. You, were, you were taking advantage of Iron Mike. Just like I wasn't. Was I was just giving Mike. the cast. Uh, I was trying to be no, nice. But yeah. He's probably thinking back. Look, dude, I give you a fucking, I give you a morsel, and you ask for the whole. Plate. You're right. So, I and, asked and, for and too by much. The way, that's He's his right. whole life, right? He's right, though. He's right. I was a dick. You're right. I just thought about it. I'm a dick, but I still. Yeah. Did. But you know, you're, you're yeah. welcome. For a cast. I'm an appreciative fucks. Uh, he was. Uh, he was on 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 uh, Franklin and Bash as well, and um, uh, Brecken had a funny little face to face with him. Uh, he was, he, it was right after he did this, um, you know, the whole thing with the, with the Broadway thing. Yeah. And it was like, everybody was so impressed with how he did. And so that's what he was supposed to play like this refined man who gave up violence. And, um, the line, like long story short, Brecken's supposed to hit him and he's supposed to be like, why would you do that? I, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just, you know, I'm a Broadway guy now kind of thing, but he took it the other way. No one gave him any direction. So when Brecken does this fake punch to, and, 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 you know, hits him, he gets in Brecken's face as full Mike Tyson, like the guy that you fear. He's like, why the fuck would you do that? And like all of us back the fuck up. And I was like, whoa, this guy is going to attack Brecken. And then after that take was over, the director's like, that was great, Mike. Uh, we're going to go in a different direction. We're going to, we're going to, you know, wow. it's, it's actually the opposite of that. You're just, you're, 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 you're the guy on Broadway, you know, that, that guy, that's the guy we want. Jesus. He's like, oh, okay. 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 Yeah. I got that wrong. <laughs> and he did it. It was, it was great. But man, he's, he's, he's still so freaking intense. Oh my God. Uh, Maya P you've been working constantly for 40 years, nearly 40 years. What advice would you give someone on how to maintain longevity in the business? Uh, whew, man, um, don't take it personally, Oof. I guess. That's the hardest thing you just said, but you're right. The, <laughs> the chief, the chief says, what's your fondest story or memory with Screech, Dustin Diamond? You know, we, we were close when we were doing the show and then all of us went our own way. So there were many, many years where we weren't in each other's lives. Um, but I just remember laughing a lot with Dustin. He was the goofiest motherfucker you ever could get uh, in, in the same room with. He made these choices that were just the choices that only he could make on, on screen. He was really good. He was a very talented actor um, at a very young age. Um, but we, we had a, a lot of good times and, and um, just remember a lot of laughter with him and playing video games. I remember playing a lot of video games with the guy too. Him and his dad, we were just sitting in his room and he had like a Neo Geo uh, back when that was like the premier gaming platform. And uh, he was the coolest Neo kid Neo Geo. My God. I mean, were, was it tough when you heard about it, you, the loss? Did you feel like he was just kind of, it was just shocking to you? Were you Were you shocked or did you know about it? I was totally shocked because a year before I had seen him at a comic con and we were next to each other and you know, it, 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 uh, he never said a word about his health. And then to find out that he died so quickly um, without any of us really knowing what was going on, that, that was shocking and, and really sad that he didn't, he, he didn't, uh, you know, connect with us a little bit more before his passing. Um, I don't, I don't think it's his fault. I just think that maybe he thought things were going to be better or, um, thought he'd get through it. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. But it, it, it was shocking. It was very sad. And, 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 uh, uh, I mean, Jesus Christ, he was only 42 or yeah, so. Just, yeah. Nuts. Unbelievable. Do you, last last question, you know, we didn't really talk about it, but with all the work and all the success you've had and all the shows you've done, did you ever have to deal, did you ever, I always ask the guests, did you ever deal with uh, any anxiety? Did you, do you still deal with anxiety? Is it something that's been a part of you or something that you look, you're looking at me like, of course, what the fuck are you talking about? Fuck, dude, I have, I have anxiety. Like I had, I had anxiety coming on your show. I have anxiety. Like <laughs> I do too. Minutes before I come on, I swear to you, I, I have anxiety. Like I'm riddled with anxiety. Me too. Um, <laughs> it, it just, it, it just, I, I don't, I don't do anything other than punish myself. Um, with sport and working out. Uh, thankfully I don't abuse alcohol or drugs. I don't, uh, I'm not reliant on any th- sort of substance to get me through my anxiety. I try to work on it by, um, making myself a better human being and, and, and finding things that will, you know, make me better. I, I got into cold exposure last year and, uh, that's helping with anxiety and, and, um, you know, there, there's certain things that I'm uh, like natural supplements that I take, uh, trying to trying to understand myself. Um, I know I'm being very vague, but no, uh, this this I, helps. I think a lot of people, especially that listen, you know, that hearing from like someone like yourself that you know you deal with anxiety, they're like they're probably shocked, you know, and it just it helps normalize that. And also, you know, you saying exercise helps you, obviously, right? You said cold therapy. Yeah. What's cold therapy? <laughs> what or cold? Uh, what is that? Exposure. Exposure. Uh, I, I did a I did a film with Ryan Quantin, and, and I, before that, I knew nothing about cold exposure. And he he basically goes into the ocean every morning and every night, and he just like no matter how cold it is. And I was I was so fascinated with that. Does a lot of meditating. I don't have the capacity to meditate as much as I'd like to, or at all. It's just like if I have ten minutes, I'd rather punish myself with jujitsu or you know hitting a, a bag or or weights or you know doing a CrossFit routine. Um, but I'm learning to really put a lot of effort into recovery and whether that's the, you know, getting enough sleep and, um, eating better. Not that I ate like shit, but eating more towards, um, eating enough for me, uh, in a way. And and that doesn't mean like consumption and, 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 uh, but eating to my body. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Well, this has been a real treat, man. I, I appreciate you coming on here and being so open and candid. You never know with guests, and you were really just forthcoming. <laughs> you are. You're just like a, you know, because I read somewhere you're you know you are you're a shy guy. You're a private guy, and when I've met you, you just you're always humble and sweet, and you just never know. I'm like, well, this could be a really quick interview, or uh, you know, and it was uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun for me. I think I think the reason why I'll tend to be shy is because I'm worried about what what can happen with my words. And I'm sure you know in this day and age now, you say <laughs> one fucking thing, yeah, I and know. it just like it, people take a, a snippet of it, and it again because I care so much, it, they take it and I go fuck. That's not what yeah. I. That just happened with a guest. Uh, you know, I had Jensen Ackles on, and um, you know he. Yeah, I heard that one. I heard what he said. He didn't, and if you listen to it, it's like I love her. She's like a sister, but she was horrible. And that it wasn't. It was almost joking. But you know the way they put it out there is horrible to work with, and it just exploded and went viral. And exploded. I texted exploded. him, and, I, and he was like, "He's like, dude, you know, I don't give a fuck. You, what can you do? It's like you know, it's like." <laughs> See, you know, we need the Jensen Eccles diet. Well, that's the diet we need. We need that diet. The, yeah. The zero fucks. Yeah. It's I, like you know. The zero sugar monster energy drink and, and zero fucks. <laughs> zero fucks. And, uh, that's that's my resolution. Zero fucks, Ryan. Ryan's my engineer over there. Right, yeah, good, lu- good luck how long that you, you break that resolution. Uh, <sighs> you have a better chance of being uh, dry for the entire 2022. <laughs> well, dude, let's get together sometime. I'd love to see you when all this shit's done and we could just get together for a, a, a soda or some shit. <laughs> soda? A beer, whatever. Yeah. We'll get together for whatever. Soda. I don't know. Do they even it. make soda anymore? I don't I mean, know. That, Do they? <laughs> I don't even. My, one of my New Year's resolutions was to get done with soda. No more sodas. So we'll do something else. What do you do? You, are you a drinker? Do you drink? Yeah. I, uh, well, I'd like to have a, a dram every night of scotch. Um, my, my wife is Scottish. Even before I'm, we were together, I was always into having scotch. 
uh, love scotch. Um, try not to do that every night, but it's pretty hard not to. Um, but uh, do you do any sport besides, I mean, I knew you were doing softball and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I do the, the softball with friends and stuff. I'm, you know, I play a little tennis here and there, a little golf. Um, and I'm going to start playing hockey again, I think, you know, recreationally, oh, yeah? I, you know, I just got to be careful, but yeah, I, I just, I miss it so much that I got to get back on the ice. Are you, are you with the uh, Bruckheimer guys? Yeah, again, I still play you... down there at the, uh, sports center, Toyota sports center now. Wait, is that still El Segundo? Area? El Segundo. Yeah. So, uh, I haven't played in like That's seven months, but I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do it. Why don't you try? It's been a while. Well, when was the last time you played? Eight months ago. Oh, well, fuck. Yeah, I played. The last time I played was 2016. Big deal. You go out one, you look like shit. The next time you come out, you look like less shit. And you just keep getting better. All right. You give me the invite for those guys, and I'll see if I can make it work. I will. I really we'll, will. We'll carpool together. <laughs> we'll we'll carpool together. All right, cool. That, that, that's a long-ass drive, too. Ah, that's a good 45-minute drive, but when you got some hollow notes in the car, you're good to go. <laughs> uh, good to see you, dude. I love this, man. I appreciate it, and I'll send. You, I'll let you know when it's coming out. Sounds good, buddy. I All appreciate right. it. Thanks for having me on. I, I, I was, uh, I, you know, I was a tad nervous. He's because, a big get. Well, I, I thought, you know, he was a great guest, but I was worried that, you know, as you know, want to talk about it. Maybe he doesn't even want to talk about Saved by the Bell. Maybe he doesn't want to talk about He talked about everything. When I brought up, did you date when you dated these guys or what did you, who was your fan? He, he opened up. Yep. I like that, man. So uh, I, I think you could appreciate that. I hope uh, you enjoyed the podcast. I know I did. I'm um, reminding you to join Patreon if you want to uh, give back to the podcast and keep it going. Go to patreon.com slash inside of you. Support us. Um, also, inside of you online store to get cool merch like scripts, Smallville scripts, and tumblers from inside of you. I think I have – there's so much great stuff. Go to the inside of you online store. And also uh, my band, Sunspin. We're recording a new album. Go to sunspin.com, and you could uh, book book the band for a Zoom. Um, I'm also on the Cameo. You know who got me in the Cameo? Who? Sean Astin. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Sean Astin got me in the Cameo, and people really like the Cameo. They like getting birthday messages and things, and I, and I have a lot of fun with it. I really have a lot of fun with it. I'll sing to people. I'll joke with people. I'll, you know, I'll do whatever. I'm a monkey. <laughs> dance dance monkey dance uh but uh look i appreciate you guys choosing this podcast every week or at least maybe just this week if you're here but if you enjoyed it maybe you'll stick around and listen to other guests we get deep and it's not like uh it's it's unlike a lot of other podcasts where they just talk about fluff and actory stuff we i try to get a little deep and we find out things that you you, you know you as a uh listener can relate to and you know whether it's anxiety or mental health issues or just facing adversity it's it's something that uh, i like to dive into when the guests are open and willing to do so uh it's this time um to list off all the wonderful patrons that have made this show possible thank you couldn't do it without you i've said it before join patreon go to patreon.com slash society but these are the top tier Nancy. D. Leah. F. What? F. Yes, correct. <laughs> Sarah. V. Little. Lisa. U. Kiko. Jill. E. Brian. H. Nico. P. Robert. C. B. Yes. Jesus. Jason. W. Kristen. K. Allison. L. Raj. C. Joshua. D. CJ. P. Jennifer. N. Stacy. L. Jen. S. Jamal. F. Janelle. B. Kimberly. E. Mike. Uh, D, E. Correct. Eldon. Supremo. 99. More. Santiago M. Correct. Chad. D. No. W. No. Close to you. Chad D. W. W. Is that what you said? <laughs> I said D. W. W. Well, I'm going to give you that. Leanne. Uh, uh, P. Janine. R. Maya. P. Maddie. S. Belinda. N. Chris. H. Dave. H. Spider Man. Chase. Sheila. G. Brad. D. Ray. H. Tabitha. T. Tom. N. Liliana. A. Talia. C. No. Uh, Talia. N. Close. M. Correct. I'm going to give you that. Betsy. R. No. Oh, you no. Can't miss Betsy. Betsy D. That's correct. Betsy D. Chad. 
Is this not Chad D? This is going to rhyme. Chad. L. Andra. L. Rochelle. Rochelle. Oh, Rochelle. Marion. Meg K. Trav <laughs> L. Dan N. Big Stevie. W. Bob, God, you know, Ryan just nailed a ton, a shit ton in order. <laughs> that is surprisingly amazing. Big Stevie W, Angel M, Rhiannon C, Corey K, Super Sam, Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Andy T, Cody R, Gavinator, David C, John B, Brandy D, Yavor, Camille S, The C, Joey M, Willie F, David H, Adelaide N, Omar I, Lena N, Design OTG, Eugene and Leah, hello, Chris P, Nikki G, Corey, Patricia, Heather, Jake B, James B, Bobbitt, Abel F, Joshua B, Abel, I just sent you stuff. I just sent you from Patreon. You know, you're in the top tier, so you get merch. I, I just remember sending you a box of merch. I'll just say that. I remember saying, Abel. Joshua B, Tony G, Sean R, Megan T, Mel S, Orlando C, John B, Caroline R, Darren B, Robbie E, Robbie, Paul C, Christine S, Sarah S, Sarah S, Eric H, Spring, and Jennifer R. Couldn't do the podcast without you guys. Uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um another week we just keep going we just keep going with podcasts it's uh you know it's it's nice because now we're going to get like uh the rest of this week off after we do our ad stay so ryan and i will have mm -hmm. this week and next week off but you won't because we'll have podcasts edited and ready for you so don't worry the podcast must go on but i know that i'm getting a little bit of a break and so are you good and that will be nice won't it yeah it's nice to get a little two-week break yeah yeah and then we'll come back and we'll fire away um don't you think well, I can't say it, but you know there is a big surprise coming, and uh, you know, I can't wait to share it with you. Once we can share it, um, you'll be the first ones on this podcast to, when I announce it to hear it. Um, something good is coming. So Sweet. from myself here in the Hollywood Hills of California, I'm Michael Rosenbaum. I'm Ryan Tez. Ryan Tez, a little wave to the camera. We love you. And most importantly, Ryan, what? Uh, be good to each other. And be good. Uh, humans. And be good. To, to yourself. yourself. Oh. Yes. I think that's the most important thing. I mean, obviously, be good to others is, 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 is important. <laughs> You're pointing at you. It's like, be good to you. Be good to Michael. Michael. But <laughs> uh, be good to yourselves. Enjoy your week. Enjoy your life. You only get one as far as we know. So just make the most of it. Have fun. Live a little. All right. We'll see you next week. <laughs>